At this time, we've asked a few people to speak. Robert Weisbuck, president of Drew University, who give us a few words on the oldest Fleming alumni at that point, right? It's good to see you. Good morning. I'm sitting with uh, Drew's other oldest alumni, Herman Rosenberg, who said to me uh, that he used to tell John that John was Drew's quintessential graduate, quintessential alum. He said, John didn't like to hear that. And I'm going to be speaking to John's professional accomplishments, but I want to go on record as saying I know too. I know that he was a wonderful man. I know that he was a great guy. I'm really honored to represent Drew University. It is John's alma mater. As we celebrate his remarkable spirit and his enduring legacy. John was associated with Drew for eight decades. As a student and one of the university's most devoted alumni, he once said that for students in his era as a student, quote, Drew was the place where we found hope and where we found ourselves. I would say that in no small way John returned the favor. Drew found itself through him. And let me explain that by paraphrasing something that John once wrote about one of the uh, founding families at Drew. He said, anyone who dares to understand Drew University without knowledge of this family is like an explorer without a compass. Well, anyone who dares to understand our university without knowledge of John Cunningham and his work is like an explorer without a compass. For 70 years, he has interpreted Drew discreetly, devotedly, and with little fanfare. We know at Drew that John's scope as an historian went far beyond our campus, as did his renown. But permit me to describe the Drew influence, and then we can extrapolate from that to everything else that he did. Many of you know that John published uh, University in the Forest, the story of Drew University in 1972. The book, which was revised in, importantly revised in, and brought up to date in two subsequent editions, chronicles not only a century of institutional milestones and measures, it more importantly tells the story of the people and times that shaped the university as we know it today. In fact, when I was uh, applying for the position of president at Drew, I read John's book. Much as John loved the place, his history is frank, and it is sometimes painfully so. I told my wife, I had read passages to her, and, and, and by John's account, Daniel Drew could at times be less than ethical. The phrase watered stock originated with uh, Daniel Drew. Uh, it derives from Daniel Drew's technique of having his cattle indulge in a salt lick on their way to market and then gorge themselves on, uh, for relief on water and then get sold according to the inflated weight that they had just gained. John also, in, in University in the Forest, is not shy in characterizing Drew's first president, a noble person, as yet also sometimes an unstable hypochondriac. As I read these passages to my wife, she said, you're the man for this job. <laughs> Even 40 years later, John's narrative remains a treasure, a treasure of university lore. Drew's present-day university archivist says that the book is, quote, never far from my desk and essential to my work. John opened a window to Drew's past that helps current and future generations of students and faculty and staff members understand what they share in Drew's roots. John's interest in telling Drew's stories did not end with this book. Over the last several decades, he contributed articles to the alumni magazine on topics ranging from wartime student life to Drew's historic architecture to biographies of influential professors, administrators, benefactors, and in the latest edition of, of 
Drew's alumni magazine, there's, there's a wonderful conversation on, on the back cover page between Herman and, 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 and John. And if any of you would like it, please call my office and I'll make sure you receive a copy of the magazine. It, it's just extraordinary and wonderful and warming. Uh, and, and these articles that, that John penned mirror his larger body of work in which he brings to life such icons of New Jersey history as Thomas Edison, Clara Moss, the Jersey Shore, Jockey Hollow. We are so indebted to him for noticing and preserving all these stories which might have otherwise been lost and then for passing them down to us in his inimitably incisive and witty voice. He is one of those relatively rare number of historians about whom you can honestly say, it's fun to read him. <laughs> Americans have a kind of double attitude about history itself. Because the settlers of these states possessed far less history than their British and European contemporaries, they both hungered for history and they resented and discounted it. My fellow Michigander, Henry Ford, first said in one year after John was born, in 1916, Henry Ford said, history is more or less bunk. And then he thought about it for five years. And in 1921, he shortened the phrase to history is bunk. He decided there was no more or less about it. And a century earlier, decades earlier, Ralph Waldo Emerson confessed, I am ashamed to see what a shallow village tale our so-called history is. Well, not in John's hands. Emerson wanted facts as symbols. Emerson wanted the particulars of history to add up to the feeling of what it's like to be alive, to be a human being. That's what history actually can achieve. And it's what John Cunningham did achieve so well. Over the years, John received numerous awards from the New Jersey Literary Hall of Fame to an Emmy. Thankfully, Drew was among the institutions able to express appreciation to John during his life. In 1955, the very first recipient of Drew's Alumni Achievement Award in the Arts, after the publication of his book, This is New Jersey, this is New Jersey, by the way, is the seminal work of New Jersey state history. In 1976, Drew conferred an honorary degree on John in recognition of his roles as president of New Jersey's State Historical Society, founder and chairman of the New Jersey Historical Commission, vice chair of the Bicentennial Committee. And in that honorary degree, he was described as chronicler of the American spirit as reflected in New Jersey. In 1980, John was nominated for the Drew Alumni Service Award in gratitude for his leadership of the Alumni Association. He was the president of that as well. That same year, he became the first Drew alum to be elected to Phi Beta Kappa's National Honor Society. And then in 2008, as the, as the university community surveyed all of this extraordinary career of John's in journalism and history and education, John was presented one of only two existing Lifetime Achievement Awards given to Drew alumni. Well, it's understandable that we at Drew feel this enormous pride in our association with John. And the university may even be able to claim some small part in his achievements. John was working on a memoir in which he notes that Dr. James McClintock, his psychology professor at Drew, was the first teacher to recognize and encourage his writing abilities. John also launched his journalism career at Drew as a writer and sports editor for the student newspaper beginning in his sophomore year. And by his senior year, he had landed his first professional job as a journalist right here in Morristown with the Morristown record. And then from there on, the rest is, well, history. I want to thank my colleague Barbara Parker for helping me to put this tribute together. Barbara's learning and eloquence and her feeling for John join with all of ours at Drew. And at Drew, John is often quoted from the foreword to the 1990 edition of his book, University in the Forest. He muses that the forest and its university are one. The forest and the university endure. John, there is no doubt 
that you and your stories are one. You and your stories endure. Thank you, Robert. Dick Florsheimer? A friend. Thank you. Good morning. Every so often, God reaches out his forefinger and touches one of us, endowing that chosen one with extraordinary talents. A special talent to enlighten the rest of us mortals, to tickle our sensibilities, and to make us more aware of how very special is this world around us. John Cunningham was one of these unique, deity-touched individuals, an inspired, an inspiring communicator who had the remarkable ability to take the commonplace, the everyday unnoticed events, places, and details out of context to add his unique verbal luster to them, and to burnish them to an attractive shine and then to make them again available to us in his writings and his talks. John gave us a new awareness of our New Jersey towns and cities, our New Jersey heritage, and our state's important place in American history. <clears throat> he taught us all <clears throat> not to forget about our great state's industry, <clears throat> pardon me, sports, transportation, education, and literally thousands of other important and often overlooked facets of our state's heritage. There was hardly a topic about his beloved New Jersey that escaped his notice or his typewriter. John Cunningham had a passionate love affair with New Jersey. Its history, its image, its people, its properties great and small, and its unique character. He would defend the state of New Jersey with all his might against all detractors. John Cunningham was one of those unusual contemporary writers who used a repertorial style. That is, he wrote like a reporter covering a story, which is exactly what he was. He wrote with rare clarity, wit, sagacity, charm, occasional sarcasm, and above all, with humor. He also had the uncommon ability to express his thoughts and writings verbally in front of doting audiences who adoringly soaked up every word he uttered. Although he prepared every speech he ever delivered, John was able to extemporize very cleverly at a moment's notice and to always say the right thing. I never saw John Cunningham at a loss for words. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> at this time, I'd like to acknowledge someone who was very dear to John, Judy Kendall, who gave John much needed comfort and love in his last years. In my mind, she is the epitome of faithfulness and love. Jean and myself and Judy and John enjoyed many breakfasts with, together at the, I guess, the uh, Brookside Diner, and they're gonna love me for this commercial. I think probably there, we had so many breakfasts there that there's going to be a bronze plaque if you care to look for it up there. <laughs> okay. I direct your attention to the photo that's on the program cover. It depicts John smiling, a truly devilish grin, which is what he had. Okay. John was not past a wicked or racy limerick, which I provided him with plenty. We got this picture, incidentally, from one we found in the post office, but we had to erase the numbers on the, on the, on the bottom. Gene and I only got to know John in the last decade of his life, but in that time, he became one of our dearest friends. And I count myself as blessed for having known him even for this, just this short time. Our 
too brief friendship will be treasured daily and venerated by Jean and me for the rest of our lives. And I can truly say that I was honored to be in his company. John Cunningham's absence leaves a great gap in our lives. I truly believe that he will be sorely missed by every one of us who had the honor and privilege of knowing him. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Douglas Kendall, a friend, and probably much more. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Doug Kendall. Uh, my mother, Judy Kendall, was John's very close friend and companion for the last five years of his life. On behalf of my mom and my family, I want to thank Reverend Tolboom and all of the members of this congregation for the friendship and the love that you all encircled John and Judy in when they came into this church together. My mom was an American Studies major at Middlebury College, and she was a school teacher in New Jersey for 25 years. Her favorite subject to teach was social studies, and her favorite teaching materials were film strips, posters, and writings by John Cunningham. So for decades before John and Judy ever met, she knew his words, She's heard his voice. Those words, that voice touched her, enriched her, just as it is touched and enriched and, uh, and imparted knowledge to generations of school, school children throughout the state of New Jersey. John and Judy were introduced by Emmy Lou Friant, a member of this congregation. The story of John and Judy was a love story, unlikely perhaps, given their ages, but that's what it was, as anyone who was in their presence together knows. They traveled together to England on the Queen Mary, to Nova Scotia, and to Florida for three times uh, to watch uh, spring training, which was one of John's great loves. They went to movies, plays, and historical dinners together, historical society dinners together. They watched John's beloved Yankees every time they could, and they came to this church every Sunday that they could together. John became a member of the Kendall family and a grandfather to Judy's seven grandchildren, including my daughter, who, to John's great delight, used to call John a really cool dude. One of these grandchildren has autism. He too understood that Grandpa John was a really cool dude. John had a unique calming presence on David. David could see John had a special calmness in his soul, a special kindness in his heart and a twinkle in his eyes. We'll all miss John, my mother in particular, but we were lucky to have known him for as long as we did, and we know that he will rest in peace, having lived in a long and amazing life and touched the minds and hearts of innumerable people. Thank you. John believed that everybody had something to say. And if you ever talk with John, you always realize by the time it was finished, you weren't talking about John, you were talking about yourself. That he had a way of doing that. So I think it's important that if anyone would like to say a word or two, I'd like you to keep it as short as possible because there's a number of people who would like to speak. So if anyone would like to say something about John, here's your opportunity. Sir. Hello, 
I'm Bob Cunningham. I'm uh, obviously a Cunningham. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I've been given the gift of uh, gab that Uncle John did. Um, but I also wanted to thank um, President Weisbrook for your fantastic speech. College of 83, class of 83. I went to Drew um, because of Uncle John. Um, my roommate has accused me of getting into Drew because of Uncle John. Because, <laughs> um, you know, and Uncle John, it was interesting. Down, you mentioned how he was the first alumni award winner of the Alumni Achievement Award in 1955. Uh, the third one was my Uncle Guy Cunningham. And I once said to Uncle John, well, Uncle Guy was the first one and you were the third. No, I was first, he was third. So he had a competitive spirit that was of the Cunninghams. I also wanted to mention one thing, what I really wanted to talk about was Uncle John was very simply endowed with the ability to listen better than anybody I have ever met in my life. Um, at the family service we had on Tuesday, Four people got up, his granddaughter Lisa, my cousin Joy, my cousin Lee, and to my never-ending astonishment, my daughter Jessica. And they all said the same thing. They all said, Uncle John took the time to listen to people, and when you talked to him, you, you knew he understood what you were trying to say. It was amazing. My daughter Jessica is not the most verbal person in the world, and would have long conversations with Uncle John. So I just wanted to say that he was the best listener I ever had. And the other thing that he had was, when he listened to you, he would tell you not what you wanted to hear, but what you needed to hear. That's a real gift. And I just wanted to say that he was a great man. My life has been changed because of him, and I'll miss him dearly. Thank you. Anyone else? I'll come and get you, sir. I will try to be brief. I knew John first in 1947 when I graduated high school and went to work as a copy boy for the Newark Evening News. I ran errands for John, getting lunch, files from the morning that he needed for his stories. Whatever they wanted, I did. And I used John as a tutor, not having had the privilege of going to Drew University to learn the trade as a reporter. It was honored to sit on the bank of reporters at the city desk when I returned from the Marine Corps in 1951. John truly was a genius. And when I decided to write a book about my 25 years at the Newark News, I went to John with the first three chapters and said, John, is this work good enough or should I quit right here? John told me, in simple words, Bob, I think you've got something there. It's a story that has to be told. Well, now he's featured in the preface of my book with those words, as the wizard of words. And his encouragement helped me finish 357 pages the old-fashioned way with a typewriter, which cost me a thousand bucks to put on a disc. <laughs> <laughs> John was a great teacher and a great friend. I was sorry on my return from vacation in South Carolina when my good friend Judge Weber called and said, welcome home, but I have sad news for you. John Cunningham had died while we were away. And I had my deepest sympathies to his family and his friends. He was a great guy. Bob Mitchell. Signing Thank you. Off. Signing off. There you go. Is there anyone else? Oh, there we go. There you go, sir. Uh, Keith Bodden, President, Morris County National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, representing the New Jersey and National in AACP. John was a great man. His books are brilliant, but more important, John's life was a witness to the people that we are and that we should be. 
and to the family, we extend greetings and we will continue to celebrate this great life, not only at Drew University, Morris County, but throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Yes. Yes, you do need a microphone because we're put Sir, we're recording this for posterity. No, we're recording this for posterity. So you will need a microphone, believe me. I carry with me one of John's books, Newark. I'm a proud Newarker, born Presbyterian Hospital, June 1946. And I had a few wonderful times meeting him with the Newark Preservation Landmarks uh, Committee. But more important was that night when John spoke uh, on Charles Cummings Memorial Service. I had brought with me my Newark History video team at Eastside High School. Well, John and Erica sang the Jersey Genie theme together. And we recorded that on tape. But the most important thing is the humaneness of that man with a young student I had here and the interest that John took in all students, in all children, in all adults. No more brave man than John Cunningham. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Go, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Diano. I'm a columnist at the Star Ledger newspaper. And my relationship with John is one of uh, mentor and mentee. And when I say that, that is one of the most uh, things I'm proud of in my life. I'm sorry about the three pack a day voice, uh, but I'll try to get through this as quick as I can. Um, the measure of, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> The measure of true greatness is that willingness to share that greatness. And there is no more succinct way to describe John Cunningham uh, to me than that, that statement. I don't even remember how I met John Cunningham, but I remember our first conversation very vividly. I was a sports writer of some note at the New York Post, and in my early 30s, I realized I didn't want to I wanted to do a more type of meaningful journalism. And I had a conversation with John about it. And I said, you know, I'm just not happy running around after these jocks. And he said, well, you know, you should look into, you know, the culture of where you're from and who you are. And if you go down that path, you'll never regret it. And that conversation was instrumental in a decision I made to leave the sports writing business and delve into New Jersey history and culture. Um, before, when the, uh, the four old parts were singing the silly Columbus song, I thought how apropos that was, because what John's life really was about wasn't history, it was about discovery. It was about discovering things that were right in front of us and imparting that knowledge to a vast audience. When I wrote my first book about the New Jersey Revolution, the opening line of that book is, I am not a historian, and this is not a book about history. This is a book about discovery. And that was John's voice resonating in my ear. About 10 years ago, John and I had lunch with my 18-year-old daughter. And the conversation centered around intellectual curiosity and her chance to go out and discover a world and being at the cusp of that, that opportunity. He was 90, he was close to 90 years old then. And I was amazed how he could, re, he could relate to a kid that was 18 and completely egocentric. <laughs> My daughter is in Paris right now. Actually, she's in Istanbul right now on a month long trip through Europe. She's a PhD graduate student, she's out discovering her world. I had a Skype conversation with her the other night and I said, sweetheart, I've got bad news. John Cunningham's died. And she said, oh, daddy, I'm so sorry. He was a great old guy. And that he was, he was a great old guy. I have my first novel coming out in September and I'm not here to plug the book. 
but it's called The Last Newspaper Man, and it's a conversation between a 1930s journalist and a modern reporter in 1999. About halfway through that book, I realized the voice of the main character was that of John Cunningham's, and that is a voice that will always stay with me forever. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm Rich Rosenthal, and I will be short. You said John sat in that seat. A number of years ago, I was speaking at the North Jersey American Revolution Roundtable, and John knew how I would get up and speak, and he had a cane. He says, you speak over three minutes, I hit you. Where's my cane? <laughs> with that in mind, before I do get started, um, I should have brought with me, uh, I sent out notices at Judith Kendall's request to the various roundtables and to my mailing list. I got such beautiful responses from people thanking me for sending the notice, t telling me one lines or two lines about John Cunningham. But one I have to share for, with you, and I read it the other night at our round table. Um, it was, came from Mark Edward Lender, who was former dean or provost at Kane University and is now retired. And one of the, th I should have had the letter, but one of the things he said to me, he says, he spoke with John at many times on a podium, and the first time he spoke, John gave a brilliant talk. He followed and read some sort of dissertation, and he learned that night never to follow John. <laughs> but he did go on to say that John was a gentleman of the first order. He said he wrote people, he wrote books for historians, not for historians, but for people to read, and he said, I will sincerely miss him. Um, Mark, is also, uh, Mark is also a American Revolution um, author. Now, in my case, you mentioned the Newark News. Years ago, I delivered the Newark News, and what always intrigued me, there was a series of articles about the author, the, uh, I'm sorry, the reporter would write about going to all the various roads on up, uh, in New Jersey to obscure towns and then writing about it. I thought this was fascinating, and Mark Diano did the same thing. Um, to the consternation of my wife, after we got married, we did the same thing. I later found out a few years ago that it was John Cunningham who wrote those articles. Uh, when I got married, my father-in-law was health officer, city of Newark, and the first thing he gave us was John Cunningham's book on Newark. I had him rededicated just recent, uh, recently because it was just a gene the generic city. But what I wanted to point out with John, a few years ago, four years ago, John had written The Uncertain Revolution, and I'm uh, the head of the North Jersey Civil War Roundtable, and I said, John, I want you to tell about your book. And first he said, I can't do that, it's a civil war. I said, John, I'm in charge of programming. This is one time that probably somebody overrode him. To make a long story short, 175 people showed up at the Freeling Heisen Arboretum. And I said, John, have you ever considered American Revolution Roundtable? And John said, have I? Norman Tomlinson and I have always wanted one. So five of us met, as most people, things happen in New Jersey, in a diner. It was the Florsheimers, uh, Gene and Dick Florsheimer, Harry Carpenter, myself, and John. And as a result of that meeting, John immediately went over to Florham Park, had a meeting, over 100 people showed up. We didn't have enough chairs in that library. Since that period of time, under John, with his guidance, the North Jersey American Revolution Roundtable is the largest round table in the United States. And we have to thank John for that. Thank you. We have one more. Oh, here we go. No? No? Yes, just moving. One more? Yes. There you go, sir. I'm Harry Carpenter, and together with Rich and the Fortsheimers, we were deeply involved in the round tables, the founding of both round tables and the Washington Association and the National Park Service. But I want to just tell you that the great ambition of John Cunningham was to bring to New Jersey and to Morristown the credit we deserve in the American Revolution. It always sort of annoyed him a little bit that Valley Forge got so much credit. And to that end, uh, the rest of us are dedicating ourselves to 
work hard to bring that recognition to Morristown as, as he so fervently wished. Thank you. As with most ministers, I get the last word. Um, and it, I think what epitomized John, and, and I'm concerned about John's soul, it's my job. Now what epitomized John to me as a good friend was something that happened about six weeks ago in the church. John was sitting here and a relatively young man was sitting behind him. And the relatively young man, the dean of the seminary, Jeffrey Kwan, found out that this was John Cunningham. And I saw Jeffrey get up, walk around, and talk to John. Because when Jeffrey was called to the seminary, the first book he read was the book that you mentioned. See, John had this way of making you better by listening to you, by encouraging you, and by loving you. It was sort of like he was a motorboat going on a calm lake and causing a wake that continued to go out in love. And he just did this naturally. He listened to you. And what really made him fascinating, he was also a rascal. He really was a rascal. When the whole world of history was going this way, John was going this way. And he thought of himself as a journalist. He didn't think of himself as a historian. As historians prove things. He wanted to find out what really actually happened. And he always had a great story. And he used to tell me that it's not a mystery when he writes. It's not a mystery. And life is not a mystery either. He used to tell me he knows where he's going. He knows the end of the story. And when it came to his memorial service or his funeral, he wanted people to celebrate what had happened in his life. And he wanted people to gather and to sing and to laugh and to cry and to get out all their emotions, but realize it was a really good run. Almost 97 years of it, of affecting people's lives. And maybe when you take everything away, all the accomplishments of humankind, it only comes down to that, doesn't it? Who have you affected in your life? Who have you made better? Who have you encouraged? Who have you loved? Who, when you look behind you, is better because you passed that way? I know I was. I think all of you were. So today we celebrate the fact that we're better because we knew John, simply. And I celebrate the fact because of my faith and hopefully your faith, that I'll get a chance to talk to him again. He'll tell me another wonderful story. He'll write something funky in the front of the book that I can always have. He'll say something with a twinkle in his eye and he'll be that rascal and I'll get a chance to talk to him again. And that is our hope. I will truly miss John, but I know where he is, and I'm happy for that. Amen.